on the telephone with us, someone who's become intimately familiar with grand hotels both in New York and probably in, in uh, other places across the world, but most recently in London. He's written a book called London's Grand Hotels, Extraordinary People, Extraordinary Service in the World's Cultural Capital. His name is Ward Morehouse III, and... Um, uh, you know what, I'm, I was going to give his whole bio again, but, but I think we'll just get to it. Ward, first of all, where are you calling from right now? Uh, I'm calling from uh, South Carolina, from Shiloh, South Carolina. I'm on my way to Savannah, Georgia, and I'm going to do a uh, book signing in Shaver's Bookstore and also uh, be interviewed by the Savannah Morning News. I wrote for that, uh, you know, briefly for about a year. I did a column from New York called Manhattan Musings, and... Uh, um, you know, Savannah had its own grand hotel back in the dark ages. It had the DeSoto Hotel, which uh, was torn down in the 1960s uh, or, or, or late 1950s. And it was a grand Victorian palace, and people like uh, George M. Cohan and Sarah Bernhardt and many of the stars of yesteryear uh, stayed at the old DeSoto Hotel. There's a, a DeSoto Hilton in its place, uh, but it's nothing like uh, uh, the grand architecture of the, of the old uh uh, homestead, so to speak. Um, the Georgian Terrace is still uh, alive and well in, in Georgia. You know, that's uh, was one of the host hotels for the premiere of uh, Gone with the Wind in Atlanta in 1939. Oh, yeah. huh. But you're 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 um, you're, you're mm -hmm. playing a, a, a grand hotel is very apt a, a date because I was just in as, as you mentioned I was in London and I stayed at the Haymarket Hotel, which is uh, not planned in the, in the sense of the Ritz or the Savoy. Or uh, say the uh, the Connaught or the, or the um, some of the the bigger establishments in, in London, uh, but it is next to the Haymarket Theatre. And one of the themes in my book is that theatre and um, and stars and and movies and hotels are very intimately connected. And John Barrymore, when he was in uh, Hamlet in London, uh, he was at in Hamlet at the uh, Haymarket Theatre, which is next to what is now the Haymarket Hotel, uh, run by Ferndale Hotels. And it was just interesting. I, you know, I, I think the last time I stayed at the Haymarket Hotel when I was researching the book was um, about uh, a year and a half ago, and, and uh, On the Waterfront was playing. It was a different version than the one that was on Broadway. It was actually very good. Yeah. And uh, uh, But um, the Haymarket, you know, Barrymore, who was in Grand Hotel, uh, the movie, not the uh, the Broadway version you played, mm -hmm. actually had to act as an actor manager to taking his show over to London because, you know, people think he was such a huge success in New York in 1922 in Hamlet. Well, yes, that's true. He played 100 performances and got rave reviews, but he still had to go sort of hand in, um, hat in hand in London and, and actually had to work about six months in order to get a, a venue that would take him. And then he had to actually... A uh, fun part of the, um, uh, the the run himself, and then of course he made a lot of money uh, when 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 it opened and got good reviews. But it it wasn't easy. It wasn't just like snapping your fingers kind of thing. But the Grand Hotels is like being in a grand opera. You know, whether it's uh, the Wall of Astoria in New York or the Plaza, or um, you know the Brown Palace in Denver. And uh, there's something about it that uh, has a theatrical atmosphere that I don't think uh, other things do. Now, Ward. Um your appreciation for luxury and sort of old and grand hotels began really at the, the knees of your dad, who was... Yeah. Well, why don't you explain, tell everybody who, who your dad was. Well, and then, he, was a, yeah. he was a drama critic. He started, actually, uh, he started in Savannah, Georgia, where I'm headed for now, and uh, used to um, have something called the Minor Stock Company. He used to put on his own plays. Oh, wow. And then he became a reporter, and uh, then he went to some, uh, Atlanta, Georgia, where he was a reporter for three years. Then he came to New York in 1919 and worked on the old Herald Tribune and then the New York uh, Sun in 1926, where he had a column called Broadway After Dark. And then he, he actually had a couple of plays on Broadway. One was called Gentlemen of the Press hmm. in 1928. It opened the same month, uh, almost the same week, as the front page, and it was actually made into a movie with Walter Houston. This is Gentleman of the Press, yeah. but the front page went on to uh, great, you know, fame and glory. And uh, Gentleman of the Press sort of faded out with the old uh, yeah. the vintage movies of the early nineteen, uh, well, actually the late nineteen twenties. So he was he loved hotels, and he lived in twenty nine hotels in New York. 
uh, when I was growing up, um, I lived in a hotel called the Hotel Seymour, which was next to, um, uh, well, when my parents were together, we lived together in an apartment house. Uh, my parents lived in the plaza in the Waldorf uh, before I was born. And then after my parents were divorced, uh, my, my father and my stepmother uh, went to live in the plaza, and they lived there for 11 years. So I would visit on weekends mostly and, um, and uh, you know, have a great time running around the halls like a, like a male Eloise sort of. And uh, that's how I <laughs> Or got, like the kid um, in The Shining, but yeah. Um, but <laughs> one thing I'm curious about, like in that era, let's say, your, your father, I mean, obviously he must have made a good living, so he was able to live in the Plaza Hotel for 11 years. My question is, like, compar- compared to what would he have been uh, that cost him as opposed well, to living was, in an uh, apartment or a house? Uh, my calculation is that and I, it's about $300 a month, which was uh, pretty high for an apartment in those days. I don't know what the equivalent, this would be in the 60s. Uh, oh, wow. I don't know what the equivalent today would be. Uh, but this is a monthly rent. Um, at one time, the plaza and, and a number of the hotels in New York had what they call permanents. And about 50% of the, of the hotels were filled with permanent residents. You know, Cole Porter was a permanent resident of the Waldorf uh, in Suite 33A for about 30 years, from 1931 you know, or 32 until practically he died. And then Frank Sinatra uh, took over with the help of Capitol Records, took over that suite and paid about a million dollars a year. So the price, oh, wow. you know, was considerably up. And, and, you know, then you're talking about a three or four bedroom huge apartment. And my father had a one, one bedroom apartment at the plaza. It looked big to me as a kid with a kitchen, but it, it wasn't, um, you know, it, by comparison to those grander places, it wasn't, it wasn't grand. It was a nice, say, one bedroom apartment in New York City. One of the things he had that uh, I'll never forget was a bear that he got from Bangkok, and the bear used to run around the uh, A bear? The kitchen. A bear, an actual uh, bear. Yeah, a little, br- a little brown bear would run. Around. It was the day era, uh, David, David, when uh, you could bring in wild animals legally. Uh, you didn't have to put them under your coat or something. You could bring them in legally with the proper papers. And he came into, I think, San Francisco, stayed at the the mark in San Francisco. The bear probably tore up the bathroom there. Yeah. Uh, the, the and then he came to New York and it tore up the. Uh, the kitchen and the bathroom, and then he had to move. <laughs> and then, I mean, not, not my father, but the bear. Oh, oh. And so um, it was, uh, you know, they're obstreperous. Uh, you know, they get bigger and they get, ver- they, uh, they get uh, not mean, but they get, um, and they're wild, animals, they're wild well, yes, things. Yeah. And, and so, so they are uncontrollable. But oh, as, a, as, a, as a small cub, they, they're yeah. pretty gentle. And, oh. and, you know, gentle like a, like a puppy dog, oh. I would say. So you got to pet the bear and play with the bear while he was a little... Yeah, I got to pet the bear and play with the bear. And, and uh, uh, you know, on, uh, as I say, on weekends, I wasn't there when he did, when the bear oh. terrorized the maid. <laughs> you know. <laughs> How would you like to be a maid in a hotel room and walking and there's a bear roaming around? <laughs> Good I know. you got to remember, it's only like two, uh, a foot long or, two, or a foot and a half long at that time. So they're, they're small and they're cuddly and cute. But you know, give them a couple months, and they're, they're you know they have sharp claws. And uh, the bear was then sent to Ringling Brothers. No, it was oh. sent to a farm in Georgia, and then eventually to Ringling Brothers Circus. Um, and um, so, but he he collected uh, wild animals. I had a, I had a lion cub growing up in oh. another hotel, the ho- hotel Seymour. And, yeah. yeah, well, it was a, just a menagerie. That's why, you know. Uh, uh, th- that's why I, I became a, uh, a drama reporter. Because <laughs> 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 of the crazy life, you know? So how did um, you, did you, I mean, this is an interesting thought. I mean, how were you able to follow in your father's footsteps? Did he open any doors well, for you? I, you or? Know, I can't say that I, I really uh, honor him. I, I can't say that I've really followed in, in the way that he did. I think there was a different Broadway, although I'm beginning to appreciate it as I've never bun- done before, um, you know, because I'm not, I do a website called broadwayafterdark.com. I, uh, I have some, a number of writers who work for the website. We have a respectable number of visitors. Mm-hmm. He really had the, uh, uh, the, the great claim to, um, to see all of the, the wonderful plays of the, of the first of this century. And I think that 
as, as the New York Sun, this is from uh, Eugene O'Neill to Tennessee Williams uh, to, uh, you know, many, many uh, uh, plays over, over the years from the 1920s really to the 1960s. And I think that uh, I sort of missed that. And I think that um, he also was a, even though he had wild animals, was a very gentle co- uh, columnist. And I, I used to uh, go to the theater with him and take notes, you know. Uh-huh. And uh, and he would take his notes, and and uh, my notes didn't make any sense. But his he, he his scribblings went into a column of of some sort. He went to work for North American Newspaper Alliance as a feature reporter, and and the the uh, Newhouse papers after the New York Sun uh, died. I worked for the Sun briefly at the uh, the new New York Sun. Oh, Unfortunately, yeah. it it, it died also too. died. And yeah, yeah. and uh, you know, just the, the cost of papers, the journalism today. Uh, you know, these websites and, and radio shows like you do are getting much more respect because, um, uh, you know, they, they're the heir apparent for the, for the newspaper business. I don't know what exactly is going to happen to it eventually. You know, the New York Times has more readers online than it does, you know, buying the paper. Well, because, you know, paper. in the old days, I, I, it occurred to me, because it's funny, I thought about this literally this week, because I looked at a newspaper, right. I think it was the Times, and it was 75 cents or, or maybe a dollar, and I'm like, Hey, you know, in the old days, you drop a quarter and you, you get a paper. Now you have to pay like a buck for a newspaper, and not just a Sunday. Sunday's like three or four dollars, and it's exactly. like no it's, wonder it's people aren't buying. Yeah, you know, and it's a shame, but I do understand it, the sea change. You know, it, it, it is a shame, but you know, also remember, I don't know. Um, it's hard to get in some cases, and you can get it online. Uh, you can Google uh, New York Times dot com or any other paper you want to. The Christian Science Monitor, or the you know the Miami Herald, and and you can get a pretty good version without the ads, uh, right on your on your cell phone or your your BlackBerry or your whatever, and I, or your computer. I think it's a it's an interesting era, and I I think in books too. I I don't think uh, London Grand Hotel is not a, not an ebook, but I'm, uh, I've got a book on the uh, a redo of the book on the Plaza coming out uh, early next year. I did one in about 10 years ago, uh, uh-huh. called uh, Inside the Plaza, History of the Plaza Hotel. And I think it's, it may come out as an e-book, first, uh, the, new, the new version. I, I put about three new chapters together. But, um, you know, it's a, uh, things have changed where your whole your newspaper's on your telephone. I mean, in, in, the ho- in my book, uh, uh, London's Grand Hotel, I talk about uh, in, the, in the chapter on Brown's Hotel, which goes back to the 1800s. Uh, the first uh, phone call was made uh, by Alexander Graham Bell in, in Brown's Hotel. And I interviewed Ira Gaston. Do you know Ira, uh, David? Vaguely rings a bell. Wrote, I don't know him, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, well, he wrote the lyrics for The Life. Oh, yes. Worked, yes. Yeah, yeah. And which uh, had a respectable run, but, you know, not not a great run. And it was, uh, uh, then he was, uh, did, did something for Woody Allen. He was, uh, uh, the, uh, did the music for the front, or uh, did the lyrics for the music for the front? And he and Woody Allen were sitting in the um, in Brown's hotel, and uh, Ira Gaston was complaining. I know Ira because he actually speaking of hotels, he lives in the Gramercy Park Hotel in New York. He's one of the only uh, permanent residents, and I think he, I don't know what he pays. They've been trying to buy him out, but he doesn't want to be bought out. But he pays, you know, comparatively nothing compared to what you would pay for a you know a single room. Of, uh, per night as a hotel guest, but he uh, he was talking to Woody Allen, and Ira was complaining in Brown's Hotel in London that uh, Zero Mostel, who was in the front, which was being filmed partly in London, he said, you know, this guy is destroying my lyrics. He every time he opens his mouth, it's a different lyric. I can't, I can't, uh, I can't sleep. I can't eat. You know, he's I, I work like a dog on these lyrics. And Woody turns to him and says, you know, Ira. You want my advice? Take the money and run. <laughs> he, said, he said, "Be quiet." You know. And you I know, think, I, I, as I recall, they don't didn't really leave any music in the front. I don't recall Mustel doing any songs uh, in. in uh, no, there was, there was, it was it was background music, and um, uh, it was uh, and and there were some lyrics in the background, and I don't know really what it was, and I don't recall myself. But that's but he told oh, okay. me that he was that he worked on it and it wasn't you know it wasn't zero but still he was a very capable singer as you know uh in uh, in many in many uh, shows but uh yeah but zero you know, does the, zero happened, the way the forum and everything but yeah. no no i don't think he had any actual songs in it well, um but uh do you, do you see yourself more do you, 
Ward, do you see yourself yeah. as as now morphing more into tra- a travel writer? Except, although you still you're the editor of Broadway After Dark, so you you're still straddling yeah. both. Lo- what is Broadway After Dark? Dark, by the way. Uh, Broadway After Dark is a is a website. Uh, it started out like as a personal website, but then I've got about twenty people working for it, including uh, Sandy Durrell and uh, um, uh, many other uh, uh, many other uh, writers. Um, Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's uh, Beatrice Rude, who was married to Bob Williams on the New York Post, uh, Sandy Durrell, um, uh, and many contributing, about 20 contributing writers, like a lot of these websites. It's not as extensive uh, by any means as something like Playbill, which has always the latest news. I try to keep up with the latest news, you know, and um, I don't, I, I, occasionally I'll break a story, like I broke the story on Patricia Neal. Uh, dying because I had an inside track to that, uh, but ironically, I called the New York Post and you know with a story, and they they hardly knew who she was. You know, they're interested in current people, and you know she was a great star, as you know, in um, in many movies and and on Broadway. She won the first Tony Award, I think it was oh, wow. given out by the Tony Com- Committee. But it's um it's 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 really sort of like a mini. Uh, Playbill Online or uh, Theater Mania. I worked for Theater Mania when Joe Corcoran had it and did some reviews. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, but I don't know which direction it's going to go. Uh, uh, very frankly, Dave, I've tried to put some travel stuff on it, but I, you're right. I have segued a little bit into the travel area. I did a book on the Waldorf. Uh, did a book on now on London hotels and on the Plaza. Well, I'm, and, I'm just uh, trying to give uh, the, the listeners a sense of. What is on Broadway After Dark? Is it columns? Is uh, it? Uh, yes, it's columns and, and reviews of, of plays on Broadway and off Broadway. We have a review of uh, Labette, for instance. Oh. We have a, a review of Pittman Painters and uh, Bloody and Andrew Jackson. So there, there are reviews. They're not as extensive. I've also tried to make a, a point. Um, we have a few younger reviewers, uh, uh, Julia uh, Giancetti, who's an actress herself, who's, I guess, in her 20s or so, and she covers some of the off-off-Broadway. It's always been my mm. my feeling that even the websites don't cover the off-off-Broadway like, uh, they, I, I hesitate to use the word they should because it's up to them. But, you know, they don't get, they get short shrift by the bigger papers, and I don't think the Daily News covers much of anything anymore, and the yeah. Post uh, uh, does does more. But, uh, Do you have a... I, I have to. I have to ask this. Do you have any hard feelings about the post? Because I was at. I was working at Playbill. Uh, huh, yeah, God, Playbill. During well, the time you know, when I, 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 I don't. Uh, my editor was uh, left, and then uh, a new editor came in. And I was fired, and I. I think I also, uh, very frankly, I, I was. It was a good thing that I was that I was let go. I mean, you usually when a new editor comes in, you you go right away. But I had an editor I worked for for five years. I did the. Um, the Broadway column for the New York Post and, right. and, and got a few scoops like The Lion King coming to Broadway and uh, Whoopi Goldberg going into Funny Thing Hammer the Way of the Forum. I, I sort of haunted the Broadway area, but I also went overboard. I think I, I, I tended to, to play, uh, to be sort of a, a, a minor uh, Walter Winchell, and I think I, it, it was a, a fortuitous thing that I was actually let go when the new editor came in. He came in and the guy who was on Mike Regal, who was I was friendly with, but he was on the New York Sun, a uh, New York um, Daily News. He took my place. Right. I don't regret it for a second. I, you know, obviously it's not fun to be fired or, or to be let go or whatever you want to call it. But it was the uh, right I, move at but, the right time. But it was a, it was a good move for me because I went more into the travel area. I also have um, gotten friendly with and reclaimed uh, some of the sources that I. And originally, when I was with the Christian Science Monitor, and, and I, I make it a point for Broadway After Dark to, to do nothing. I don't do gossip, and I don't do uh, mean mean spirited mm. stories. And I got to the point on the post, I think, where I was I was mean spirited in some cases. I would you know cover the gossip, and sometimes uh, uh, you know it, it may have been untrue. And I would I would listen to someone who said, "Oh yeah, this, there's a big fight backstage," and that kind of thing. And uh, you know, um, it was it was not good. It wasn't healthy for me because uh, I didn't grow up in that kind of uh, atmosphere. My father was not a gossip writer. Uh, he was a, a you know a, a reviewer and a columnist who covered the news. And actually, so I've um, patched up a lot of uh, 
hurt feelings that I think that uh, that people had, uh, and I tried to not make amends, so to speak. But but uh, and, and very often I, I did uh, some did get some scoops. You know, the unfortunate thing about uh, David, but people like uh, Walter Winchell, is that he he was very good to a lot of people. You know, one word from him, and I, I remember when I was in the post. Uh, I I did some positive things too, but of course when you're uh, you know when you're out of the job, they say oh he was no good or you know he he got things wrong or he was too mean or whatever you whatever you want to say and 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 there's some truth in that too. But I think that um, now I uh, you know I've sort of gone home again in the sense that um, I've I've kind of gone back to the kind of theater uh, coverage and feeling about the theater that my father had. You know, which is a very warm, sort of friendly feeling. But uh, yeah, you know, it's not fun to to lose a job that, that pays very well. You oh, know? sure, of course. So, no, I mean it, it uh, was. It, it must have been a difficult time. But looking back on it, it was it was because you would not have been happy under that new regime, which you know. No, I, I would have been, yeah. been happy, and also I would I I, uh, I would have been happy continuing to do what I did. You know, right. being a gossip reporter, really, for, you know, the backstage stuff. And I'm not criticizing what Mike Riedel does or what other people do. Some other people, uh, they're not that many of them that do yeah, that right. kind of it's stuff. Yeah, it's a small field. It's, 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 I, and it wasn't me, really. I mean, it was because I did it for a couple of years, but uh, I, it, it was uh, it was not pleasant in some ways. And I, you know, uh, uh, but well, let anyway, me ask that's you, the way it goes. Let's, let's move, move back to the travel uh, aspect because you have yeah. just written this yeah. this new book, London's Grand Hotels, which is published by the way by Bear. Oh, I can't read the thing on the Manor, slide. What is it? Bear Manor Media. Bear. And, you know they do a lot of nostalgia books. Uh, they've done some books on Roy Rogers, on uh, you know Andy Devine, and many um, King Vidor. Oh, I think yeah. that's how you pronounce it. Yeah, the yeah. Old, oh, uh, King Vidor, uh, yeah. Uh, silent movie director mm-hmm. or movie director, and uh, people like that. that you know names you've heard of, but maybe not the biggest stars of uh, of the day. I mean, uh, uh, you know, somebody else may have done Rio Valentino or John Barrymore, but they've done the um, you know Tom Bix and and some of the uh, other uh, other. So they're, sure. they're, they have a good internet presence too. Good for them. As I mean, I've Manor. never heard of them, but I, I, they put out a nice book. <laughs> well, is this also yeah. in hardcover? I know you you sent me a trade paperback. Uh, it, uh, it's going into hardcover in the spring. Okay. Uh, the, the, uh, that is really the best time for travel books, they say, is is the spring. So it's going to be made into a hardcover in the spring. And then, uh, you know, I think we've gotten some, you know, some nice little write-ups. Cindy Adams did a little write-up of it. And, and oh, uh, cool. um, you know, other some travel magazines have done some things. Uh, but And uh, I think we'll get a, a review or two uh, with one of the bigger papers. But it's... Um, uh, it'll be a hardcover in the spring. Yeah, I, I, you know, you never know. Um, I, usually, it, it used to be that the hardcover would come out first, and then it would go into paperback. But um, I don't. Uh, they're expensive to produce, right. and so the publisher, uh, you know, they run on. They say they claim they run on a slim margin. I'm not so. I'm not so sure sometimes. Oh, but wow. uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you actually, know, this day and age, they probably do. But yeah, but the nice yeah, thing is, this day and age, they can publish a book and do a run of. You know, five hundred copies, not twelve thousand. I and mean, then they can that's do right. reprints. That's, that's exactly right, David. Yeah. And um, also, also throughout the whole industry, it's become more of a print on demand. You have, uh, you know, if Steven Spielberg uh, writes a book, or you know, um, uh, uh, Tom Hanks or somebody like that. Yeah, uh, they'll print you know five right. million copies. Right. And um, uh, you know, but for most authors today, many of the um, Books are print on demand. With the digital technology, you can print up copies in a matter of a week, and so they don't have the shelf space. Uh, they don't want to take the risk of printing copies that are just going to sit there. You know, forty. Um, this is not a, a self-produced book. It, it's a well, no. you know a, a small uh, a publishing company. But forty authors, I was told, and again, this may be in the realm of gossip, uh, left Knopf to uh, go on their own and publish their own works. And these were um, recognized authors, maybe not big stars, but Knopf is one of the big, uh, big uh, imprints. Right. And because they realized that they weren't getting the publicity, they weren't getting the, the back office help that they needed to promote books. And with the Internet, they could do better on their own right. um, and making their own deals. So 
you know, it's a, it's a, it's a brave new world in a way, or uh, maybe, uh, I don't know what it is, but it's a different <laughs> new world. And I think that uh, a lot of it is dependent on the on what the author is willing to invest in, in promoting the book, you know. Yeah. Uh, and you've done a couple books yourself. Well, I've written the introductions for that, that Best Play series a few years back. Right. And also uh, right. I have a book published in, of all places, Russia, where a bunch of academics wanted to publish my plays, which I was very... I was like, okay, thank you. And they did. So, thank you very much. Yeah, right, right. But not, yeah, not in America. Yeah. 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 But it was... Um, yeah, and, and, it's yeah. A, uh, and the smaller bookstores are also... Uh, every, sort of every big town has, like... Uh, uh, Savannah has Shaver's bookstore. There's a big bookstore in Denver. I forget the name of it. That's uh, that's huge. It's an independent bookstore. But places like the Applause Theater and Cinema Books that published. Uh, well, that's gone. Man. Of, I mean, they, yeah, I think they gone. still publish, but their, their store is gone. Right, right. And and you you're familiar with the Drama Bookstore on 40th sure. Street, which is across from the new New York Times building. Uh, they were telling me that they they're having a tough time. I don't think they're going to close because they're very much a specialty shop. Yeah. Now, uh, my book is available in London at the uh, uh, at some place called the Dress Circle, which is in Covent Garden, mm-hmm. and they do both CDs and uh, and books on the theater. And uh, you know, I had to explain to them that the book also includes many theatrical anecdotes uh, uh, with uh, Vivian Lee and Laurence Olivier and mm-hmm. uh, and and people like that going going way back. Uh, uh, you know, to the turn of the last century, uh, like 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 Barrymore, or he wasn't the turn of the last century, but he was in, in the 1920s in London. But it's a uh, uh, it's also something called Stanford's Travel Store, which is a huge travel store. We don't have anything quite like it in the big cities in New York. I don't think we used to have the Hammond Map Store, you know. And uh, I, I uh, everything's going online, and so you don't need. To, the physical presence of some of these stores. The, the Barnes & Noble is closing at 66 in Broadway, or oh, 67th Lord. in Broadway. Wow. And, is the strand, and, did uh, the Strand close, or is that still there? Oh, well, that's still there, the I believe. Still yeah, oh, yeah. And that, uh, I think that's a mainstay, and, you know, goes on for miles of books, or blocks of books, anyway. And uh, the, the Barnes & Noble, of course, has a number of stores in New York that are not closing. The one, what it 20th Street or 19th Street and 5th Avenue and the one mm-hmm. at 86th Street and so they're they're around. It's just that big one that was near Lincoln Center and uh, sort of the some of the theatrical people went to uh, is uh, well, you uh, know, has announced it, it yeah. was closing. It's, yeah. it's it's kind of like the, the publishing industry. Really, this coming decade is going to be hit with the same thing that the music industry was hit in the late 90s and and the 10s. So the, the whole thing sea changed. It's just like you have to find a new, uh, a new paradigm. You have to find a new business model because either that or you're just going to sink. Uh, you know, I mean, the Kindle that's, that's as exactly well as the right. web, all you of that. Uh, it used to be you get a contract for a record, you know, and, and uh, uh, you know you you uh, it was a pretty good deal. And now there are very few and far between that get those contracts. Remember. Remember Laura Bell Bundy, who was yeah. in Legally Blonde? I think she went to, uh, maybe she's done pretty well, but the whole idea, she went to Nashville to try to get a contract, and I think it was difficult, and maybe she succeeded. You know, she's a good singer, and but I haven't heard too much about her. It uh, doesn't mean that she's not doing very well in, outside of New York. No, but most but of the great, not, the great, uh, well, I, I follow more rock and pop rather than, than country, but, I mean, right. so many of the great rock and pop artists went independent in the last decade. They come, you know, they finished their contracts with their major labels and they said, uh, well, maybe not the big, big, big acts, but the smaller and intermediate acts, people you've heard of, just said, okay, you know, I might as well, I'm going to make more money just touring in my little bus with the little band and selling the CDs you know, at the end of the show than I will try to deal with a, a big place I won't even pay me. Right. And that's, that's where yeah. the money is these days. Uh, but it, it takes a, you know, even people like, uh, you know, the, the huge superstars like Keith Richards and the Rolling Stones, they, they tour, you know, every day, practically. <laughs> and so, and, and so they, and they're the, you know, the top uh, money uh, earners, or one of the top money earners. But, you know, these it's true of these bands that you and I may never have heard of, or, or only vaguely. They have to do that in order to make a living. And uh, so... Um, if that has changed, nobody's going to do it for you and, and you know, sell your records. The Virgin Records store in, in Times Square is closed. You know, it's... Uh, 
Oh, the tower. The Remember, they used, to, they used to be a tower up on 66th and uh, Broadway. That closed about more than five years ago. Right, right. And so what, if you're a rock, a pop rock artist, uh, what do you do? Uh, how do you make a living? I don't know. Um, you, uh, you could do a Broadway show, I guess, or you... Uh, uh, and that's that's no success. I think you know one thing I'd like to see about Broadway and mm-hmm. is that I'd like to see more younger playwrights, and I don't mean chronologically, um, get a chance to do a Broadway show. I think it's it's unconscionable that 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 more uh, playwrights can't get a shot at Broadway. And it's always been my theory that they should take a few of those theaters, the Manhattan Theater Club, and you know I guess um, roundabout there. They're, they're starting. To do they're, they're trying, especially yeah. MTC. They have a Broadway theater now, and that's helping a little bit. Uh, right. Everything else is right. either revivals or stuff from London. You yeah. know, musicals. Yeah. Musicals. Young people are getting a shot now because you've got Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson, and you have Avenue Q, and you've got. I mean, there, there's po- <clears throat> pockets there where that's starting, but and then also if you have a huge hit off Broadway, if you're maybe David Auburn or um, what's her name, Sarah Rule. Sir Rule got lucky. I mean, she she wrote a wonderful play last year that I think should have right. won the Tony. So there's a little, little bit, but it should be not one or two per season. I mean, you, know, you grew up, your father grew up when there were 300 plays on, uh, shows on uh, Broadway. On Broadway in the 20s, that's yeah. correct, 300 opened. And, and in London you have many more, um, uh, you know, shows, uh, uh, many more uh, comedies and dramas open, and they run shorter uh, periods of time, but... I, I think that the the union costs are so tremendous oh, on yeah. Broadway, and it, you know why should a one person or two person show? Uh, look, I don't know how much the show with Patrick Stewart, The Life in the Theater, costs. It's a very lovely, lovely show, uh, nice comedy. You know, it's a revival of the David Mamet oh, yeah. show I about twenty yeah. years ago or mm-hmm. so. And um, I don't know how much that costs, but I, I, do you have you know how much that costs? But it shouldn't cost. There are more stagehands coming out and moving the scenery than oh. I. Now, they, that they, ruined the they, show. Yeah. Um, I, I like, you know, that's a lovely play. If you get to see, I'm, I'm talking also to the listeners, the uh, right. video version of that with Ellis Rabb. They did it about 25 years ago or so. And it, it's a, this right. lovely teleplay that they made out of Mammoth's play. But it's a very difficult play to do because the scenes are very short. And suddenly yeah. the actors have to go off, change makeup, change clothes, change <laughs> the scenery. It's, a, it's an insane play. Mammoth was young when he wrote it. He didn't really know what went into having to stage something like that. But if you get a, a, the right director, they can finesse it. And, and the whole point is to make it seamless and transition very quickly. On Broadway, yeah. because they wanted to throw money at it and put big, you know, big boat up there and sets, uh, suddenly, yeah, okay, they're throwing thousands and thousands of dollars at it, and all they're doing is having these poor stagehands schlep this giant scenery on, and then a minute later, schlep it off, and it killed the show. Right. I, I, I know what you mean. I sort of, I tried to ignore that, you know, and I said, although once in a while, you, you know, you, you had to look up and say, who are these, are these guys moving the scenery? You know, it's getting away from the story. Yeah, the moment, and, there was um, no momentum. Like, every time you, it was building character or you're seeing the arc yeah. of the, their relationship, and it's like, oh, oh, and then, boom, like, lights down, they have to go on, change their makeup. Uh, it, you know, by the, the show should have run 75 minutes, and it ran 90. And it, right. all, that extra 15 kills it. Also, um, on the waterfront, you know, which I saw in London a couple of years ago, mm-hmm. was a very um, scaled-down version from the one on Broadway. It wasn't really anything like it. And if you know the, your, uh, if your listeners are familiar with the movie, it, it's a very intimate movie in that some of the, uh, the most... Um, Glorious scenes are the ones in the back of a taxi cab when he, oh, yeah. uh, you know, when two people are talking together. But it um, it was it worked on in London because it uh, uh, it was a scaled down version and it was intimate. On Broadway, they tried to build the Brooklyn Bridge practically and and the the, the Brooklyn waterfront and you know it was I think that they they tried to do what they thought was best but it wasn't. Yeah. Uh, Actually, it, it was I, I have to say I saw that Broadway on the waterfront and I liked it. I thought the story okay. still held, even though it was done big. But I can imagine it yeah. working like um, like gangbusters in, in an intimate setting. As a matter of fact, and I, I don't mean to 
to steal your thunder here, Ward Morehouse. First of all, I want to tell everybody we're talking to Ward Morehouse III, author of London's Grand Hotels, Extraordinary People, Extraordinary Service in the World's Cultural Capital, published by Bear... Ma- not Bear. God, it's so uh, Bear tight. Bear Manor Media. Bear uh, Manor and Media. Okay. Media, and the website is pretty extensive, bearmanormedia.com. And you'll find everything from Tom Mix to Roy Rogers to well, not just Western stars, but uh, uh, people like Fanny Bryce and uh, mm. you know the old time um, Broadway and vaudeville people and, well, and film yeah. people. Well, what I want to you know, tell uh, what, what I want to tell listeners about, uh, especially at UNC, the University of Northern Colorado, is there's another example of what we were just talking about. Uh, they're doing at the school Blood Brothers. Now, this show, you're, you're the London guy. You know that's been running in London since 1988. It's still running, yeah, right? Wow, yes. I, 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 I know that. I didn't, I, you hardly notice it when you go over there now, but I remember it on Broadway. It, it didn't do too badly, but it had a much shorter run. Yeah, it didn't happen on Broadway. It, yeah, it just the, the flaws were just too big, and they, again, they did it big, and it just... it was oh, Some people really loved it, but the critics were eh. And it didn't catch on the way, certainly, that it has in London. Well, here, I saw the production at UNC last week, directed by John Leonard, and they do exactly what we're talking about. He scales it back. It's small. It's intimate. It's in a little theater that holds, I think, about 125 people at most. And in fact, they wow. took away one side. It's a, it's a theater in the round, but they took away one side so they could put the orchestra on, on one area. So it's... You know, it's it's a three sided theater now with even fewer seats, and it. I mean, there's still problems with the piece. I don't think the lyrics are very good, but it's a it tells a very, you know, a good story about class structure and these two brothers who are raised separately and all that. And you get into it, and it's very tense, and it, it's amusing, and you get into the characters, which you totally lost on Broadway. So there is something yeah. to be said yeah. for the scaling back. And, and I, I do want to, you know, since I broke in, I want to remind people that they have three more chances to see Blood Brothers at the Norton Theater at UNC. They're playing two shows today, a matinee and an evening show, and one more show tomorrow. And um, so, sorry to break in to do this work, but uh, actually we've been talking for a while and I haven't had a chance to do commercials and stuff. So oh, definitely. You, and you're, you're also on, uh, have an yeah. extensive following on the web, don't uh, your show? Oh, well, well. Gosh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, it, it, you know, again, it's extensive. Uh, it's getting back to what you were saying earlier about the music business. We're, we're sort of, it, it's one thing to get on the web. It's, it's another thing to get listeners or, or oh, yeah. viewers or people that, uh, you know, uh, are visitors. Well, to, to, I've been doing this for eight years, so hopefully there's a couple of people listening here and uh-huh. there. But if you're listening in, in around Greeley, Colorado, Blood Brothers... 2 today and 7.30 today and then tomorrow afternoon at 2. Um, let's see. For advanced tickets, call 970-351-2200. 351-2200. It's at the Norton Theater, which is located on uh, the central campus in Gray Hall. Uh, let's see. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, and, and this is... <laughs> this will mean nothing to you, uh, Ward, but if you go and you're, um, you fill out a thing at... Um, at the theater, you can win. A, uh, you get a chance to win free tickets to see Keisha, who is apparently playing locally uh, in either Denver or Northern Colorado. She's a some pop music icon person. So if you go, you you leave your ticket stub and your number on it, uh, and they give you a box to put in at the end of the show. And then on Sunday night, I believe to, tomorrow night, they'll be doing a drawing on the air. Uh, Sunday at seven o'clock for the winner of the tickets to Keisha. So, so it's another reason to go see Blood Brothers at the Norton Theater this weekend. Okay, so, sorry, sorry to pull focus from you, Ward, but we're talking with oh, that's all Ward right. What's the name of the uh, bookstore in, in in Denver, Colorado? It's it's again, it's like the Strand in New York City. Uh, oh, I don't it's know. An independent bookstore. Good for them. I, I'm You're glad right. there is one. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm not that. Yeah. Uh, I, I mostly stay in and around Greeley because we don't have a car at this point. So uh, we haven't been to Denver very much except to the airport. But if anybody knows, <laughs> drop me an email. Dave's gone by at AOL.com. I guess I can Google it, but I'd rather talk to Ward Morehouse for a few more minutes and ask him some of the, the cool, funny, 
weird anecdotes about these people in these hotels, these London Grand Hotels? Well, you know, uh, one of the uh, grandest hotels is the Savoy uh, Hotel, which opened recently, and that's where uh, Vivian Lee and Laurence Olivier first uh, set eyes on each other in in the dining room. It's, it's reopened after what some say is a half a billion dollar Whoa. or half a billion pound um, uh, renovation. And it's a Fairmont Hotel, but it's owned partly by um, Prince Al Walid, who is the Saudi Arabian yeah. billionaire who at one time oh, actually owns part of Fairmont. And uh, But anyway, uh, many famous stars, Elaine Stritch had lived there when she was in London. She now lives in the Carlisle. I don't think I'm telling anything out of school because she's, she announces it at sure. her shows. <laughs> and uh, there's, there's high security there. But um, Richard Harris, uh, who was in uh, Camelot, the movie, and many other plays, mm -hmm. many other, well, some and plays and, films. and, and yeah. many movies, uh, lived at the Savoy. And um, he would... Um, They'd have to corral him uh, for his for to pay his bills, and, and when he had the cash, he used to run up his he used to run up his bill. Uh, and when he was working, there was absolutely no problem. Right. But he would be six to twelve month uh, six to twelve month periods when he didn't have any any work, and so uh, the manager would have to uh, run him down and uh, not literally, but uh, well, track yeah. him down and say, uh, uh, Mr. Harris. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about your bill, and, he's, and Mr. Harris, Richard Harris, would say, "Well, let's go next door and have a Guinness." And, um, and fifteen uh, Guinnesses and he said, later, I'll only talk to you if you have a Guinness. And so they went next door, and uh, um, uh, the manager would say, "Mr. Harris, you owe us a lot of money. When are you going to pay?" And of course, he was in Harry Potter, the movie, he made a pile of money, and he oh. was able to pay his bills. But uh, the only way I could, that the manager could get through was to, was to uh, go next door and have a Guinness with him, have a beer with him. But uh, Charlie Chaplin and his family lived at the Savoy, oh. and one of the, uh, the former managers or assistant managers, Derek Picot, who's manager of the Jeremiah Carlton Tower th to this day, or, uh, or, or currently, uh, said that as a young manager, young assistant manager of the Savoy, he took Mr. Uh, Chaplin and Ona, uh, Una Chaplin, yeah. who was Ona O'Neill, Una, and um, you know Geraldine Chaplin's mother. Maybe the children. Maybe Geraldine was young. I'm not sure exactly how old she was at the time. But he, he took them up to uh, took them up to, to their suite on the river. The Savoy's right on the Thames River, and uh, everything was in order. They had a bottle of champagne, that kind of thing. And then Derek Picot walked into an armoire or a closet instead of walking out the front door. You know, he's so nervous. <laughs> Uh, by serving Charlie Chaplin, right. who was a oh, icon of the film business in uh, in America, and uh, he walked into the closet. And he stayed in for a few minutes, then he came out, <laughs> <laughs> and then and then Chaplin was looking at him very bemusedly, and 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 said, and uh, and uh, there Pico said, "Yeah, I was just checking." Of course, there was nothing to check. He was in a closet, <laughs> you know, and it was dark. <laughs> Oh, but he, once he got in the, he told me later he got in the closet. He didn't know what to do. He was hoping they would leave and go to the bedroom or right. just go and out the hall sneak. or something and oh. go about their business somewhere else in the hall. Uh, that he, they didn't leave. They were sitting there, and when he opened the door very gingerly uh, and shamefacedly, there they were looking right at him. You know, he was so like falling through the floor. You know, oh, and it was great. one of those odd uh, uh, experiences at, at at the Savoy and. Uh, you know, they, they, um, I recently took a tour of it and they had a, uh, uh, at one time they had a, um, not a revolving uh, stage, but a, a stage that uh, used to come up from the floor like uh, Radio City Music, no, not Radio City Music, yeah, Radio City Musical, I guess, and, and the, uh, uh, the Rainbow Room at the, Ooh, at, yeah. at the Rockefeller Center, you know, that kind of thing, but I think that the hydraulic system was, has been taken out and it's now part of a bar. A uh, new bar that's been installed in the Savoy. You know, a lot of people uh, uh, used to go to the Savoy, Churchill and Noel Coward and, and uh, many, uh, Cole Porter, uh, many people uh, stayed there, many people went to the American bar at the Savoy, which looks exactly like it did, say, in the 1920s or 30s. Very stark, very white, um, you know, full of, uh, it doesn't have a lot of charm, but it's uh, where... American uh, theatrical people uh, sort of flocked, and uh, and uh, some of the more famous uh, uh, British theater people like Noel Coward. And there's a Noel Coward suite which I took a tour of in the Savoy. Of course, Noel Coward didn't um, uh, never stayed there, at least um, oh. uh, as far as they know. 
Plus, he may have visited friends there, but he never actually. They just named the suite after him and sort of gave it a very Art Deco look. And, uh, you know, it's kind of a fun idea that. Well, to speaking, stay, to speaking stay of there, hotels, um, Meryl Streep and yeah. uh, you know other people. I, I've got a number of stories of celebrities who, uh, when I was in London, I was working for Reuters and I, I was interviewing uh, uh, Richard Branson, and so hmm. he got so tired of me following him around that uh, uh, we went to school to pick up one of his kids, and he said, "Will you pay my parking meter?" Well, I'm in getting the kid, you know. Yeah, and I. I and he's this billionaire, you know, I'm paying his parking meter for him. But um, Well, billionaires we don't necessarily have a dollar in their pocket while they're, they're you know, <laughs> that's that's the old right. joke. Like, yeah, and that's the old story like Jack Kennedy, right? Uh, my, my favorite story about Jack Kennedy at, at uh, the Plaza um, was that and it, uh, my book is Inside the Plaza or InsideThePlaza.com and Kennedy and, and I guess Jackie were there at the, at the uh, Persian Room and uh, Hildegard, who was the famous John too, sort of right. like uh, uh, <laughs> Montevecchi or you know some of the people around today who do do cabaret. But anyway, it was a, a more of a nightclub setting, a big nightclub setting. Tony Bennett used to do the Empire Room of the Pla- of the Waldorf uh, years ago. And uh, anyway, so she she slipped and fell uh, when Kennedy uh, was was uh, at ringside in the Persian Room, and and she got up. And with some assistance, and she said, "You see, see he was a senator. This is Senator uh, John F. Kennedy." And uh, said, "You see, Senator, I've fallen for you." Oh. <laughs> so she she made a great a graceful uh, exit, you know. <laughs> and um, but she was a great character, and so some of these people are uh, are great characters. George M. Cohan uh, was a great uh, devotee of London hotels and looked at the Savoy Plaza in New York, and and uh, of course wrote all those songs. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, were uh, one of them, uh, not a Congressional Medal of Honor. What I, I get something like that, and, and from uh, Roosevelt. And oh, wow. he was uh, he, he traveled to London on what they call the fast boats, and uh, then they would uh, go to the Savoy or or the Ritz or or that kind of thing. And uh, and you know, it's it's a place. The thing that's fascinating about hotels is you can go there and you don't have to spend a, a lot of money on a big suite there. You can go and just have a drink at the uh, Riverly Bar at the Ritz or at the uh, American Bar at the Savoy or have a cup of tea. You don't have to have all those muffins and everything. Yeah. And just enjoy the atmosphere. And it's, they're public places. And they're, and you and I can, uh, you know, are, uh, don't... Uh, where where is entitled to, to sit in one of these bars or these little little places in these hotels in the lobby and, and enjoy it as much as any as somebody staying there. Somebody paying five hundred dollars a night for a suite, you can go in there and get, you know, a beer for five, six dollars and soak in the atmosphere for an hour. I mean, which is kind that's, of nice. that, that's exactly right. And some of them, um, uh, uh, believe it or not, have special deals where you can get uh, like a complimentary breakfast for two, you can get the bottle of champagne and they're located in areas uh, that are much more convenient. So you can, if you can't save money, uh, they're not as expensive uh, in the long run as you want, you might think. I mean, I don't know what the Waldorf is today, and, and maybe some people complain about the long lines of the Waldorf, uh, you know, the, uh, the check-in places. But uh, at one time, I think uh, during the uh, worst of the downturn in the economy of last year, yeah. you could get a room for like, um, you know, $180, which... Uh, you know, it's, uh, wow. it's pretty, pretty, pretty good comparatively. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, the location is good. Fiftieth and and Park Avenue, Fiftieth and Lexington Avenue. You can walk over to the theater and and that kind of thing. Uh, uh, in New York, the Edison Hotel is a. Uh, I, I've never stayed there, but it, it's where the Edison, the so-called Polish Tea Room is. And oh well, everybody's the eating in the uh, Polish Tea Room. We've all, <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, we've all done that. It's, it's, um, let me. Uh, po- what is the, it's the Edison Cafe, the the, the Edison uh, uh, diner. Uh, right. But and let me Edison ask you, Ward, about and um, Neil Simon did yeah. a, a play of uh, Forty Five Seconds from Broadway, set in the Edison Cafe. Yeah. Well, I, I, uh, the cafe is better than the play. It only lasted Forty Five Seconds on Broadway. If I was writing for the <laughs> Post, I'd say. You know, it shouldn't have lasted forty-five seconds. No, yeah. imagine. It was it was pretty yeah. bad. Yeah, but let me let me ask you, Ward. It, literally in the news this week, it just occurred to me that they're trying to sell the Chelsea Hotel 
in New York. Yeah. It's not um, I'm not a glamorous place by any stretch, but what are your thoughts on that and, and the stories that come out of there? Well, it's it's got to be the most illustrious, uh, one of the most illustrious hotels of them all as far as artists and writers and musicians. Uh, uh, Sid Vicious was found dead there. Whether I guess he was murdered, I'm, I'm not sure of, of what happened. But, but Thomas Wolfe uh, lived there. Uh, Brendan Behan uh, uh, lived there. Um, you know, uh, many authors and writers and musicians, uh, both pop rock and, and classical, uh, lived there over the years. In, uh, Pete Hamill um, uh, lived there after he was uh, getting a divorce for, for a year or so. He told me uh, it's a great it's a great place. It's you know tourists some tourists unless they're a little have a bohemian streak might not like some of the rooms because they're they haven't been updated. I would hate to see it become a boutique hotel with all the finest um, you know gold faucets and, and amenities and. A beautiful cabinetry uh, in, in the in the rooms. Now, some people are on per, uh, what they call permit leases. They have long term leases. I don't know what they could do with those people. Maybe they're on uh, rent control. Yeah. But I, I I think it would be a shame to turn it into uh, you know something that it's not. You know, you can do that with a lot of buildings. Uh, there's a beautiful hotel called the Crosby Street Hotel, which is new construction down near the Public Theater, and that's beautifully designed and. And it's a um, you know first class, uh, very. Uh, it, it, it has a sister a sister hotels or brother hotels in London, the Haymarket Hotel, the the Covent Garden Hotel. They're they're exquisite uh, gems of places. But that's a uh, brand new well, hotel that they construct from. A, right, right. They're it's not a brand taking new hotel they constructed. Yeah. But I would hate to see the Chelsea turned in. No matter who buys it, whether it's a wealthy individuals or or a chain, turn it into some kind of uh, you know cookie cutter. Place it would be like the Algonquin, you know, which has very small rooms, and uh, I think it's owned by the Marriott people now. It changes hands so quickly, mm. so so frequently rather. But um, it's it's run. I think the reservation system at least is uh, the Marriott, and maybe that's good for them. But you know, you'd hate to see it, you know, that lobby torn out and put a modern lobby in, yeah. uh, or uh, the rooms. I think um, you know leave a little bit to be desired because they have probably haven't been updated. But I don't know if they have or not, but. I, I, but I if you update the them, keep the old feel, you know that kind of thing. That, that's right. That's exactly right because there are plenty of new hotels in in New York or, or uh, in London. Uh, you know, some people in London don't like what happened to the Mandarin Oriental Hotel. That was uh, a Victorian hotel right on Hyde Park, and uh, you know the exterior is uh, the same as it ever was, but inside it's very modern. Brown's Hotel, um, which I mentioned. Uh, uh, that was started originally by uh, a, 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 a lady in waiting to uh, Lord Byron's uh, oh. wife uh, was uh, a um, uh, back in the early 1800s was uh, just as one little townhouse. Uh, Brown's Hotel is very modern on the inside. Some people don't like it, but you know that's. Um, I think younger people uh, like that trendy uh, mm. quality that the modern uh, schemes have. I I. I uh, must say that I, I, I'm, uh, you know, I like the old, the old style better. Let me and ask you more. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We, we only have a couple minutes uh, left to yeah. talk here. Now, one thing I'm curious about, like when we're searching this book or the other books, um, you know, in case someone like me wanted to do what you're doing, I'm curious, like, is it sort of when you're a theater critic, one of the, the perks is, because you don't really get paid a lot, is that you, you get to go to the theater for free and you know, the the trade off is that you have to write about it and, and all that and study right. about well, the show. Right, that's correct. Um, in traveling, well, how yeah, much. There's, there's, yeah. there's, there's no free lunch, even in the theater. You, you might get, go for free, but you still have to produce a review or commentary or something, your right. website. But I, I think that, yeah, the, the, one of the perks is you do get complimentary rooms. I've never. Oh, wow. In all, in all, the, in all the writing, I mean, not all the time, but in, in, in some cases. Uh, in, but in all the writing, I've never asked for a complimentary room or a what they call a free room you know uh, I, there's no such thing as a free room because you're doing something for it you know whether you're writing about it whether you're a vendor whether you're you, uh, whatever you're doing uh, but when, not, when you go not, to to visit like one of the hotels in, in your books yeah. it's like do you do you go to the front desk and say by the way I'm here to write or or how does that work uh, out that they know that you're there to do 
what you're well, doing. Well, I think, I think that you have to really talk probably to the PR people and just say that I'm, I'm going to do a story for, you know, um, oh, uh, Travel and Leisure or whatever. A lot of the magazines these days are, and the, and the newsletters, and that has changed too much. So finding a travel writer who's actually on the staff is like finding, uh, you know, a hen's tooth in a, yeah. in a payoff or something. It, it's just... Uh, you go. You call the Times travel desk, and you've got two people there. So I think on the staff, I, I, maybe it's more, of course. But but you know, the, it's changed dramatically. Uh, the tra- a lot of travel writers are, are freelancers. They call the uh, the PR uh, people for the hotel just, and they have a track record uh, of doing either travel stories or entertainment stories. You can see their stuff on the web. I, I'm sure they can see yours. They can see mine, and. And, so uh, you plan you know, beforehand. They have a generous yeah. policy. They'll accommodate you if you're, you know, legitimately mm-hmm. doing a, a story or a book or something like that. Uh, it's a, um, uh, you know, they tend to. Um, in some cases, I've I've been charged like 150 dollars for for a room, and you know, I paid it. And uh, in other cases, it's been complimentary. So it's a, um, but it, it, it it's I couldn't afford to do it otherwise. And I I, I think the travel writers. Uh, the old policy of the New York Times was that they couldn't accept, I don't know what they're doing with freelancers, but uh, the, the New York Times and the Christian Science Monitor, some of those older established papers, uh, wouldn't accept, um, you know, what they call junkets by mm. uh, four travel writers. And, and it had to be offered uh, to um, the paper, and then the paper could offer it to a freelancer, I guess, is the way it goes. Uh, but uh, I don't know. Um, I think if you... If you're doing a legitimate story, uh, it's just like getting tickets for a, uh, for, uh, for a uh, bet or, right. or uh, you know, the life of the theater. Some of the Broadway shows, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the press agents are pretty savvy. They'll accommodate you, uh, you know. Uh, because they know within a week or two or three or, wh- or whenever, you, you'll you be writing something that is posted that people will see. That's, so, that's yeah. right. I, do, I also do, David, a, a column for a, a travel newsletter called uh, Travel Smart... Um, TravelSmartNewsletter.com. It goes to quite a few thousands of people. Yeah. It's on the web, TravelSmartNewsletter.com, and it's also sent out as a hard copy. So I do what they call the checking in column. And I've done that for about four years. And I go to a hotel. I, uh, for instance, this, uh, this summer I went to um, oh, Cooperstown, New York, and did a you know, big uh, uh, three-page spread on Cooperstown and where you could stay. Uh, there's uh, there are several old uh, Victorian hotels that have been breakfast. So I stayed in one, and I talked to people who ran other ones. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I – and so it was a nice uh, – Cooperstown is known for being – has a baseball hall of fame, but it's a lot more. James Fenimore Cooper lived there and wrote uh, – said some of his uh, novels is that, in that area. They, is that why they call it Cooperstown, or is that just a coincidence? Yeah. No, no. Uh, it's a. It, it's named after um, his father, who was a judge, uh, Judge Cooper, um, oh. who was a, a New York uh, State judge in that. I believe in that area, who settled there. And uh, James Fenimore Cooper, the son, wrote about um, Cooper's down at Lake Glimmerglass, which is uh, there's another name I can't recall at the moment, but he called it Lake Glimmerglass. So when you read the leather stocking tales, yeah. it's actually. Um, uh, he calls it Lake Glimmerglass, but it's another name as well. Uh, that that area is, is protected largely uh, from a lot of the tract of uh, home building that is on Lake George and some of the other other lakes in um, in New York State. So that's a good thing in, in for Cooperstown. But it's so close to New York; it's an hour. No, it's it's about three hours away. Uh, but it's it's a nice. Uh, you don't have to be a uh, you know a dyed in the wool uh, baseball fan either although many people go for that reason I'm you know I'll go to an occasional game but I'm, I, I can't call myself a fan really well I, I, uh, I actually yeah. I went to uh, Canton Ohio about a year and a half right. ago for other re- I mean really the only reason to go to Canton Ohio is the football Hall of Fame really not that much else right. out there even Akron right. sorry sorry Ohioans but you know but still but anyway we, we kind of right, have to right. wrap this up well, I want to roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland <laughs> Although there's yeah. a Cleveland Playhouse, too. Oh, yeah. I wanted to do a story on Cleveland, and I've actually talked to the Cleveland. Also, another thing is the, mm-hmm. the people that are helpful, the various tourist bureaus are very helpful yes. and accommodating. So, uh, uh, you know, so it's, uh, uh, 
I think it's a question of, um, you know, they're, they're interested in publicity. And uh, I try to be fairly honest about uh, writing about these places. And, and uh, uh, you know, so you, um, you know, and I'm honest about the price, too. I mean, I, I couldn't afford to stay if I was paying full price in some of these hotels. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, the, the Cole Porter suite at, or the Price of Suite at the Waldorf is 147000 a month now. Good That's Lord. a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it amazes me some people can pay it. That's that's the more amazing thing. It's, it just doesn't it doesn't just sit there empty. That there's some rich person who can who will pay that. Amazing. That's exactly right. And then I think that uh, you know we we little and it's very often they're not uh, Americans. They're uh, they're uh, you know from 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 foreign countries. In the case of uh, that particular suite, the Capitol Records uh, pitched in on the I don't know exactly the breakdown, but then when Frank Sinatra lived there. For a number of years, they uh, there was some uh, money that they paid. You know what the and he paid. I, I'm not sure what what the uh, Cole Porter paid considerably less because he got it in in the depths of the recession. I mean the, the depression in 1932, and I, they were practically giving away the rooms. So Elsa Maxwell, who was a, oh, nice. a, a columnist, um, uh, lived there, and she, you know, various reports say she lived there rent free. Uh, I think she, but again. Uh, she worked for it. She she organized parties at the Waldorf. She did a column that always mentioned the wall at Waldorf, and uh, that's another thing that changed about hotels. You're not supposed to write uh, if you can help it. Write about um, stars or public uh, public people, people stay public um, yeah. names that are staying in the hotels unless they're at a public event. For instance, Liz Taylor and Richard Burton used to stay at the Dorchester, so you could and do movie premiere um, junkets there and. Uh, talk to reporters in the public spaces so you could write about that, but you you really were prohibited or you, it wasn't uh, advised to uh, to write about, you know... Um, if someone just happened to be staying on, there. On their own. Yeah. Well, yeah. there's a privacy issue and, and kind of makes sense, although it is good. And, you know, it's good um, publicity for the hotel maybe after they've left. <laughs> well, right. right, Michael. Michael Jackson actually stayed, and I didn't put this in the book. The uh, Lanesboro is uh, uh, right across from the Duke of Wellington's uh, ancestral home at uh, one uh, number one London. That's the Duke of Wellington's home. But the Lanesboro is on the site of uh, the old uh, palace, uh, the Duke of Lanesboro, and uh, right at Hyde Park Corner. And Michael Jackson actually. Um, uh, stayed there uh, on some of his visits to, to uh, London. I didn't write about that because I think I was, I think he was still alive when I was still doing research about it. Mm. And, uh, you know, the, it's a an unwritten rule that you don't write about anybody that's really, for security reasons. Years yeah. ago, uh, the, the hotel PR people used to put out press releases with the, the guests that were coming in with their, not only their addresses, but their home phone numbers. Yeah. It was a different world. It was yeah. in the 1950s I came across old press releases with society figures, phone numbers, you know, addresses and personal phone numbers. Um, and it was a, you know, now it's a different world. Everybody's security conscious or worried about, yeah. uh, you know, terrorism or worried about uh, their personal safety. And, and and I guess for good reason. I think that sometimes we're a little too obsessed with it. But, uh, you know, it's a, it, it, it's a different world than it was, uh, you know, 40 years ago yeah. when... Uh, um, we didn't have as uh, many threats to people's safety. It didn't seem anyway. Of course, London underwent the uh, London uh, Blitz, and a lot of the, some of the hotels were bombed. Wow. You know the uh, and so it was not a, a ver uh, thirty thousand people died. I mean, it wasn't a it was a terrible thing, and many many more were wounded. So um, it was an awful thing, and uh, but they lived through it. And uh, one place that the people like to stay in London. Uh, during the Blitz was the uh, Dorchester because it was reinforced concrete. Yeah. Um, it was one of the only hotels that, at that time, the other hotels were, you know, stone and steel, and but this was reinforced concrete, so when it, uh, it was hit, um, it uh, I didn't have a direct hit, I don't believe, uh, it was a bombing from the uh, German so, uh, Air Force. But well, China uh, got rattled a little bit, but, but the rest of the, the building stayed okay. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly, right. Yeah, and uh, so um, um, Pam Pamela Harriman uh, 
uh, first met uh, Avril Harriman during the war, and then they later married about 30 years later. So at the at the Dorchester, um, and it's a you know very fine hotel. It's owned by the Sultan of Brunei right mm-hmm. now, and um, you know I, I think some of the stars uh, gravitate toward the smaller places, the more boutique hotels, because there's uh, there's more privacy. When the Rolling Stones are in London, I'm not exactly sure where they stay, but they don't stay as a big uh, glitzy hotels. Um, uh, they stay at the smaller bo- boutique hotels. Maybe they have their own homes there. I don't know. Yeah. But well, anyway, we, so, we, we we have to wrap this up, Mort. But um, this has been really, really a lot of fun and, and great talking about the theater and travel and hotels in New York and London. And certainly, if people want to read London's Grand Hotels, Ward's new book, um, for, they can go to the website of the publisher, as you said, Bear Manor Media. Dot com. Well, and you have to, uh, yeah. London's Grand Hotels dot com too. Oh, London's Grand Hotels dot com, and also and to check more, out a little bit more about the book. And yeah, to check out Ward's writing, you can also go to Broadway After Dark dot com, and and not only Ward's writing, but that's the site that he edits with all sorts of reviews and stories about New York and Broadway, and probably some travel too at this point. So Ward. Last question. What are you? Uh, I know you're updating your book on the plaza. What are you? What's your next project that you're tackling? You, you know, I, I I don't know. Uh, there's several possibilities, but I, I really at this point I um, doing a little bit of promotion. I thank you very much for being on your show, and um, you know uh, I think the Broadway community misses you because I think you were a, a fixture there yourself. But you must uh, it must be a nice. Uh, it's a little um, Colorado's nice. Than, Colorado What's has that? its charm, you know? It really does. Oh, yes, I, I bet it does, for you. <laughs> compared to uh, 42nd Street and Broadway these days, with, with uh, you know, the, it's a kind of a madhouse. But, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not sure yet, but I, I'm uh, toying with the idea of another hotel book. And, um, you know, there's always uh, uh, another another city. I've actually done a, um, some hotels in San Francisco, like the... Uh, the Fairmont and, and others. I've done some in Los Angeles, you know, for magazine articles. But um, mm-hmm. I don't know. Uh, I haven't been out there uh, recently, and also I think you really have to spend some time there uh, to do some do some research. And uh, you know, I think uh, sitting by the pool at the Beverly Hotel would be a hardship at, at this yeah. point for me. <laughs> <laughs> don't you? I mean, that's. I. I no, I'm joking. Oh, yeah. Oddly enough, you can you can go there. I think I never stayed in the Beverly Hills. I've stayed at um, a couple other hotels, and but you can go there if you have lunch there. You can use the pool, so that's a tip for your Ooh. listeners. You know? and, yeah, Sweet. nobody. You know, it's like uh, nobody uses the pool there because they all have their own pools. Oh, that's so you, you have lunch, you have a, like a, a a turkey sandwich, and then you. Uh, and you use the pool. But and even, nobody's gonna say, Ward, even say in anything. the finest hotels, you still have to wait a half hour after you eat. <laughs> still, like <laughs> yeah, right. doesn't matter how fancy the pool is, you know, you still need right. to wait a half hour. <laughs> right. Well, Ward, Ward Morehouse, thank you very, very much. Um, best of luck okay. with your travels and your writing and your website, um, and thank you really for for having a delightful chat with us here uh, in in our special neighborhood on Dave's Gone By. Thanks so much, man. Thanks, Dave. Okay. Bye-bye.